Okay, um, my name is Espen Barteide, managing member of the managing board of the World Economic Forum. And I will both introduce and moderate uh, this uh, session. Um, and Marie Slaughter, who was supposed to be with us, will, will be with us later, but not in this session, so I will do both. Uh, very happy uh, to have this uh, uh, stellar panel. Um, the World Economic Forum over the last years have uh, em increased its emphasis on issues of international security and geopolitics quite significantly, to the extent that uh, one-fifth of the overall program is on issues broadly related to that set of subjects. Why does the World Economic Forum do that? Uh, you would believe from its name that our primary focus is on more the economic issues. But it's because uh, a significant number, a majority of our members and partners and, uh, 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 and people we work with do see the very close relationship these days between the global economy, societal developments, security, geopolitical trends. And we are indeed living in a time of uh, deep uncertainties. We see a series of uh, regional conflicts in the Middle East, in, in Africa, uh, in Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, even in Europe. Uh, we're seeing um, uh, class classical conflicts conf confined to one country, crossing countries, but we also see the advent of new and hybrid forms of conflict and competition and we see the uh, a topic that we introduced uh, last year and was a theme of several panels the return of uh, strategic competition between key players so we're trying to understand what is this big picture and we have a, a great uh, panel to help us to start this and i want to say right at the <coughs> outset that this is the first panel i think for those of you who made this this morning this is your first panel at this annual meeting apart from the concert uh, uh, last night, but it will not be the last opportunity to discuss these issues. So see this also as the opening moment for a broad discussion that will run through. Uh, the purpose of a context session, this is the security context, and context on Wednesday is meant to take stock. So where are we? What's happening right now? What is the global picture? And on, um, on uh, Friday, we will have a security outlook, which will be some of the same topics, but more where are we heading? What will be the agenda of the coming year uh, and the years uh, to come? Um, we, have been, um, we have been bringing in uh, more people from the security field, security experts, security practitioners, military intelligence leaders, uh, defense ministers, foreign ministers, people in this broad space, also to build a community of people working on these issues. And you will see more of this as we go along uh, in the coming days and also in, in, in the continued work of the forum. Today we have with us uh, Jean-Marie Guénaud uh, from the International Crisis Group, which he uh, leads, uh, a distinguished uh, governmental career uh, from France, uh, and also well known for his many years at the helm of UN peacekeeping as Under Secretary General for Department of Peacekeeping Affairs at a time of massive investment in, uh, and massive change in uh, UN peacekeeping. Admiral Jim Stavridis, uh, now Dean of the Fletcher School, uh, a military practitioner come academic uh, that uh, continues to focus strongly on these issues. Yeah. So happy to have with you. Your last military position was uh, SACUR, Supreme Allied Commander of NATO in, in Europe. We interacted a lot uh, those yeah. days and we continue to do so. Very happy to have you with us here and in our ongoing work. And then, of course, uh, last but not least, Foreign Minister Luis Mushuki Babu uh, from Rwanda. Uh, foreign minister for many years uh, from a country that uh, has both uh, been at uh, the midst of uh, one of the bloodiest conflicts in modern times, but also really come out of this and now is a key player in African security. So this is the cast we have uh, uh, this, uh, this morning. And I would like to start with you, Jean-Marie. Um, what are we actually seeing? We're clearly empirically seeing many different conflicts, as I mentioned. Is it coincidental that they are all happening at this time, or is there a big picture that you see when you, as crisis group boss, uh, looks into all of this from, from an analytical perspective? No, I think you can connect the dots. Uh, when you look at uh, the world today, there is something that has always existed, which is competition between major powers. But what is different now is that there is no agreement on the status quo between the major powers and there is no agreement on how you change it. Uh, and so you see the result 
uh, in the Far East, uh, you see the result in uh, Europe, uh, you see the result in the, in the Middle East. That's one big thing that really goes right through the world. I think a, a second point is that it's a, it's a much more bottom-up, so to speak, world, which in some ways is a very good thing, because it means that the people are taking charge. Uh, but in another way, uh, can be a source of many uh, dangers, because it means that in many countries where the state is fragile for a variety of reasons that we, we could spend the whole uh, d discussion uh, analyzing why you have many fragile states around the world, but because of that fragility, because of a sense of lack of inclusiveness, you have a lot of challenges to the stability of states and to the existing order. There is also there a challenge to the status quo. And I think a third element is that there is more connectivity in this world. We used to live in a world where what happened here did not, uh, what happened there did not have much impact here. This is, when terrorism, for instance, is something that, there was a lot of terrorism in the 70s, but it was quite, what the big difference between the 70s terrorism and today's terrorism is the connectivity, is that something that happens in any place in the world immediately has worldwide reverberations. So that means we really live now in revolutionary times. Mm. But revolutionary time, you know, as a Frenchman, you always go back to your own <laughs> national history. Uh, not revolutionary time in the sense of the French Revolution. Because it's not about one country. And that's the big difference. The transnational, I mean, it's, and it's linked to the connectivity, the transnational dimension of today's uh, changes uh, mean that uh, negotiating end of conflict, and we do, we're trying to uh, find compromise, is much harder because there are some conflicts which are still contained to one particular place, but more often than not, they're hijacked by transnational forces with transnational agendas. And then what can you negotiate? It's much harder. And of course, the result of that is the tragedy of the refugees, is the tragedy of uh, violent uh, extremism, a number of things that we can analyze. But I think these are some of the sort of and broad brush, uh, what are we seeing now? Just before we move on, on, on connectedness, uh, the role of social media in all this, how, how important is it for people trying to understand the security reality of the world? It's, it, it's very important because it's become an instrument of mobilization. You, have a, you can belong in a virtual community uh, today, in a very strong virtual community. And there is, it can be a force for, go for good, it can be a force for, for bad. I mean, like every technological transformation, it has, uh, it has two, two sides. And we see how, for instance, uh, Daesh mm. is recruiting uh, on the internet. Uh, when you look at today's terrorism, um, what is on the market for terrorism today? You, if you had been born, uh, if you'd been active 40 years ago, you would... Uh, you would have gone to the Bader Meinhof or to the Red uh, Brigades. Today, if you want to challenge the established order with violence, you do it with Isla Islamic extremism. But how does Islamic extremism build its following? Through, in large part, through the internet when it comes to, de to uh, highly developed countries. The reasons why you join Daesh are not the same when you are in Syria, in Iraq, or in France or Belgium a very different reality uh, emerging that we have to understand and take very seriously. Let's have a look at this from Africa. Um, uh, in your, you have a series of um, trouble spots uh, in several parts of Africa, but mm -hmm. there's also been a significant effort over the last year to build African responses to them. And that if you could give an update mm -hmm. on this, but mm -hmm. also if you like comment on what Jean-Marie already said. Sure. Um, let me pick up... Uh, two important um, aspects of, of security uh, that uh, Jean-Marie just uh, mentioned. One is uh, inclusiveness, mm. and the other one is revolutionary times. So when we look at Africa um, in general as a continent, um, we see that a major part of security um, 
problems has to do with people feeling a sense of exclusion. It can be ethnic, it can be economic, or simply neglect. And when people feel neglected in these revolutionary times, then we're in trouble. Second, um, I, I think, and I will not, uh, being a foreign minister, I will not uh, name countries specifically, but on my own, uh, in my own part of the world, in Africa and other parts as well, I think leaders need to get back to the basics of leading people, uh, paying attention to citizens, giving them um, a minimum of belonging to their countries, to their state, uh, regardless of the, the economic condition. And I think that's been lacking. We need to figure out um, where we plug in as many of our citizens as possible. That is part of, uh, of bringing uh, stability. And the experience of my own country, Rwanda, which was um, basically uh, completely destroyed in, in the summer of 1994, was that uh, we had to make sacrifices, very difficult decisions, to start bringing the people of Rwanda together, making the kinds of sacrifices that <coughs> give them a sense of the country is yours. What we have in this country is going to be shared um, it's not always equally shared. That's the reality of politics. Mm -hmm. But this country is yours. We will uh, struggle together. Um, and if you are in leadership, you have to do more than everybody else. So w uh, we really look at uh, security, particularly I in Africa, as, uh, as a very important part of just daily life. Do I have a roof on top of my head? Do I have food on the table? Is my child going to be able to uh, go to school and afford it? Can I or my neighbor or my sibling uh, be part of the leadership uh, of, of, of the country? So really, um, the whole management of diversity, mm. any way you look at it, the mismanagement of diversity, and it, this is not just Africa, uh, is, is part of the, the, the problems uh, we see um, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, security and or insecurity. So uh, for me, and I think, uh, I, I can't speak for the whole continent, <laughs> but uh, uh, since I'm here from the continent, I think it's important to start looking at matters of security with the basics, um, again, inclusiveness is critical. Uh, if, if for nothing else, every one of our citizens needs to own something, uh, needs to own part of the country one way or another. Without that, um, in these really interesting times, whether it's social media, whether it's just pure revolt, um, it becomes very difficult to keep the countries uh, safe, to keep the countries uh, together. So that's an aspect of security for me that I think is important. What we have done in Rwanda, which has been a lifesaver in the last 21 years, is to talk to each other. And it continues today. We have even uh, made it constitutional to have a national dialogue every year, chaired by the head of state with Everybody represented, teachers, um, um, business people, uh, government officials. So we sit down at the end of the year and kind of evaluate ourselves. Where are we going? And, and these are major sessions held in parliament over three days. Citizens call in um, messages on, on social media. Rwandans abroad 
across the world participate in that dialogue. So I think as we look at security as a very critical part of just being alive, uh, for me, I think it's very important to, um, to start with uh, what uh, could seem like smaller things, which is um, giving people a sense of, of life, giving people a sense of, uh, um, you know, of a future, of, of giving a, a some level of, of hope. Even when we don't succeed, mm. it's important that most of our citizens feel that they are going somewhere that they are not neglected. So I think inclusion, inclusiveness, um, basic, uh, basic economic rights are very, very important uh, for, for uh, not just security, but long-term stability. I, it, it, this is very interesting. Our, uh, last week we presented the Global Risk Report as the World Economic Forum does every year, one week before Davos. And what you said resonates perfectly with uh, one of the key findings, which is that we're seeing a global loss in trust, uh, social cohesion challenges to precisely the sense of togetherness that creates the sense of unity on which, let's say, a nation is built. And this is a phenomenon that is not only uh, happening in parts of your neighborhood, but also in Europe, for instance, that we see the social trust and cohesion is going down, inequality is going up, and the speed of change is now so fast that um, at least there's a perception among a lot of populations that the leadership and the regulators are not able to cope with the pace of change and that creates you know a, a downward spiral which i think has quite immediate uh, and significant security effects so i think these points are are very important Be before we go to you jim any of this that you'd like to comment upon from from your perspective well no i think the inclusivity is a, is indeed a key a key point and we see the, the problem is often that uh, it's about politics, and then it turns into ethnicity. Ethnicity is manipulated for political uh, ends, and that's, that, then it becomes very, very dangerous. And, and, you know, 21 and a half years ago, at the whole world after the horrors uh, in, in, and the massacre in Rwanda, which, by the way, I know affected your family very directly and in tragic ways, um, the whole world said, never again. How, how are we doing? Because uh, immediately to your south in Burundi, well, we shouldn't compare one case to another. There are clearly political mobilization of uh, ethnic uh, lines again. And does the world, uh, this is a leading question, of course, but does the world pay the attention it should to that uh, challenge? Let me be cynical and say <laughs> that uh, the never again has sort of become never mind. Um, <laughs> but, that said, and again, you know, what Rwanda is today is, is the sum total of its experience, good and bad, in the last two decades. Um, we countries, we leaders, um, must make sure that we are doing our best. Whether somebody else comes in to help, whether the United Nations Security Council does something or doesn't, it's very important that we count on our own good leadership. Give it a try, um, give the ownership that we were talking about. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, the international politics is, is uh, rarely local. Uh, and when it comes to some parts of the world, uh, li like uh, Africa, so in, in Burundi, um, I would say, first of all, Burundi shares a lot with Rwanda. We're the same people. We're sort of twins. We, our languages are very similar. Um, and so Burundi affects Rwanda automatically. Uh, we have 75,000 refugees that just came in um, over a period of, of uh, two to three months. Um, and the sad thing in, in Burundi, which you know, needs to be addressed uh, sooner rather than later, is that a ruling party split. Uh, the problem was basically political. Uh, the party of the current president uh, split, and many of the people around him left him. Uh, he fired them in the party. He fired them in the government. And they left uh, the country, they fled, some of them to Rwanda, some of them through Rwanda to 
Europe and, and other parts of, of the world. So that's basically the problem. It, it, it's the, this whole discussion of whether uh, the president should have run for a third term, whether it's constitutional, with, um, that's not really what the heart of the matter is. The heart of the matter is his party became very weak and the people around him uh, gave up on him because they, they disagreed on whether he should be the one uh, to run again or whether it should be the party. So once we have that uh, political problem and usually a lot of confusion about what's happening in Africa and uh, many cliches and, and so forth, then mobilization mm. uh, for one side or the other uh, starts taking on uh, different shapes, including uh, ethnic shape. It, we are not there yet. Uh, Burundi remains a deeply <coughs> political problem, but the temptation is there. And I, I think a good reminder for all of us that when something is presented to you as an ethnic conflict, look closer because it may actually be modern politics in a very unpleasant disguise. I think that's what we learned from, the, from the from the Absolutely. South Europe. Absolutely. So, uh, Admiral Stavridis, Jim. Um, what we talked about so far is what we could say the bottom-up, uh, to sure. use uh, language, is the, the fragmentation of states which creates, as we know, very violent conflicts, but yeah. because of inability to maintain cohesion and states. There's the opposite trend, mm -hmm. uh, which may seem paradoxical, but which reinforces this, I believe, mm -hmm. but where, which is that strong states are competing mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. maybe not at Cold War levels, but definitely more than 10 or yeah. 15 years ago. And some of that takes place in, uh, in Asia, in East Asia, I think, mm -hmm. and also in maritime space. Yeah. Over to you. Well, let me begin by just saying thank you, and it's terrific to be on a stage again with uh, my former Minister of Defense, our Supreme Allied Commander, who knew would end up here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm now the Dean of a School of Diplomacy, so I'll be diplomatic and say I think both of my colleagues are right. Which is, to say, <laughs> which is to say it is great power politics, as we have seen over the years. But I really agree with Madam Minister that the overarching problems in today's world, I think, do stem from uh, inclusion was her term. I'd say it's the inequality piece tied with what Jean-Marie said about visibility. In other words, in today's world, you get to see how others are doing in ways that perhaps you didn't in the past. And I think that creates a lot of the, the firmament that Jean-Marie is exactly right, that then gets manipulated as part of great power politics. Um, as I look around the world, we, we sort of touched on Africa. We, we mentioned, and you can't get through a panel like this for more than six minutes without mentioning the so-called Islamic State. Um, I'll tell you what I also worry about, and you mentioned Asia. I think uh, what is transpiring there, in particular on the Korean Peninsula, is extremely concerning. And we've seen a nuclear detonation for the first time in, in decades. Um, we have a young leader there who's very unstable. And it's in the middle, as you say quite correctly, I've been of this, um, this, this cauldron of uh, tension between Japan, China, South Korea to some degree, North Korea to the north, um, all of that kind of bubbles in a, in a great power way, but manipulating the dark <coughs> memories of the Second World War. And overlaying it are a sense of uh, challenge as these economies come online, the smaller nations around the South China Sea. So I think that pot is bubbling, and I worry about that a great deal. I worry about events in Africa, not only sub-Saharan Africa, but in northern Africa, and its impact as it flows north into Europe, uh, coming out of Syria. When you put those trends together and you look at the pressure within Europe, I think that's extremely concerning as well. So that, that pot, if you will, is bubbling. But one thing we haven't touched on, which I worry about, perhaps oddly, more than anything else, is actually cyber. It is our, our vulnerabilities in this world. This is kind of the dark side of the globalization that Jean-Marie spoke about so articulately. And if we think about a world in which nine billion devices are connected to the internet, by 2020 there'll be, you can almost pick a number, 20 to 25 billion devices. Terrific, we're all gonna be very interconnected, there'll be great transparency, but vulnerability comes with that and it allows these dark forces in asymmetric ways to try and 
uh, inject their venom into the system. So that's a, a little basket of challenges. I, I do want to close by saying something hopeful, if I'm allowed to. Um, you are. Thank you. Um, I, I, I think, it's, I think it's worth noting uh, Rwanda 20 years ago was a nation that was indeed destroyed. And yet today it is, it is recovered in so many ways, recognizing all the challenges that go on. That's very hopeful. We mentioned an anniversary 21 years ago. Let's recall in Europe 20 years ago, Srebrenica in the Balkans. The Balkans of 20 years ago looked a lot like Syria today. Yet, We've made great strides there. Albania, uh, Montenegro about to join NATO, Croatia in NATO, European Union. When we want to solve a problem in the Balkans, we don't reach for a rifle anymore. We reach for a telephone to call Brussels. So my point is, as an international community, we can do this. And I'll close it all by saying Colombia, which is a nation that's been fighting a 60-year insurgency, Juan Manuel Santos, I think, is about to deliver a peace deal there. So despite all of the challenges in international security, I think if we work collectively, if we address these exclusion inclusion issues, if we are cognizant of the great power politics, we can make progress. Thank you for that. It's an excellent in, in this panel to remember <laughs> this uh, tone of optimism that the problems have been solved before. Yeah, that it may happen again. It's a caution, careful. Cautious, yeah. optimism. <laughs> We have Carl Bildt and others in the room who've been very much involved in the Balkans, and I remember from back then there were a long list of experts saying this will go on, you know, for generations, exactly. and there's no solution. And well, guess what? It changed. Yeah, so, the comment so. was they've been killing each other for centuries, and they always will. Yet that is not what's happening today. There are still many problems, but we can do this. Yeah. Both statements tend to be wrong, by the way. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they were not killing each other forever. And exactly. Not, yeah. So that's good. But let's, let's stick to this geostrategic competition again, because I think sure. one phenomenon that a lot of our you know, primary membership is interested in, how does this affect the global economy? Yeah. And, and just a suggestion from our side, and again, to the risk report, I hope you now take note, download it, read it. It's a great report. But it's saying that there's a rise of the use of geoeconomic tools means that the instrumentalization of normally peaceful or economic measures in order to continue, let's say, continue war by other means. Sure. Maybe under the shadow of nuclear threshold, because yeah. uh, after all, and thankfully, nuclear powers normally don't like to go to war with each other, so they do other things. Uh, can you expand on this? I can, and I'll, I'll start by returning to mm -hmm. cyber because this is precisely why I think our vulnerabilities are so extraordinary there. The barriers to entry to using that tool are lower than we have ever seen for a potentially destructive mechanism like that. In other words, we have the greatest mismatch in cyber between level of danger, very high, level of preparation, very low. That's extremely concerning, and I think it bleeds into the geopolitical because if you want to pull that tool out and use it, uh, you can do so, and it's even difficult to, <coughs> to attribute it. So an example would be the Sony Pictures attack, when Sony Pictures made a movie, kind of mockingly, of the young leader in North Korea, cyber attack on Sony, $300 million in kinetic damage, more damage to its business reputation, difficult to attribute precisely, probably came from North Korea, using cyber to have geopolitical impact and economic sphere. Um, so I think cyber is the place I would look at uh, the easiest way to use those kind of tools uh, indiscriminately. And it'll be both nation states and uh, anonymous type hackers and sometimes the confluence of the two. And it lowers the threshold, right? Exactly. Because it's easier to decide to engage exactly. in a cyber war than to go to a physical yeah, war. And because you may not. And then you don't know where it ends. Exactly. Mm. And, and I think it Please. was actually Carl Bildt who said that cyber at aggression is much cheaper than cyber defense, yeah. which creates a lot of instability. It's much mm. more expensive to protect oneself against cyber Indeed. Attack. And if you want to look at the very dark side of the spectrum, and I guess that's what we do here, it would be attacks on electrical grids, mm. which uh, we've just seen a little taste of that in Ukraine. Again, 
difficult to attribute, don't know where it came from, but the ability to take down segments of the electric grid uh, potentially over long periods of time can have, obviously, enormous economic impact on societies. Very worrisome. Carl, you've been uh, put on the spot here already. Can <laughs> Carl, do you have a microphone? Yeah, because it's, well, it's, broad, it's, it's webcast. Mm. I very much agree with what uh, Mr. Greedy said on the uh, sort of the cyber element of it. Immediately after, if you go back to European issues, immediately after Crimea, hybrid warfare was the sort of thing that everyone talked about. Small green men <laughs> and the problems of dealing with that. I wasn't too agitated about that because I think that's essentially a police operation that can take care of that. But what we see now is a f another form of hybrid warfare. And that is the sort of c cyber coming into every single conflict. Mm. As said, we're beginning to see this in, uh, in Ukraine. There was an attack on the Ukraine power grid, and no doubt that the origin of that is in Russia with a group that is fairly well known. Whether you can say that that is part of the Kremlin apparatus, that's difficult to do, but on the other hand, is it entirely <laughs> unlikely? And subsequently, there has been what looks like an attack on the air control system of Kiev airport. And this is another form of hybrid warfare, where it's not primarily the small green men, but the numerous uh, black bites uh, or bits that are intruding our systems and then degrading the ability of our societies to work and doing it in an anonymous way. That is a form of hybrid warfare that I think we have to get used to and that is far <coughs> difficult to deal with than the small green men that was in the focus of the debate a couple of years ago. Would and like and le let me add that, that here we can talk about Russia as a fairly big actor, but the problem is of course that this can be done by very small groups exactly. very far away. Exactly. Um, do you have a microphone here? Yeah. Thank you. I'm Bernie Myerson, IBM. Um, I can't agree with you more, but what I find particularly concerning is the asymmetry that the digital economy has created. You know, we talk about the digital economy as a very powerful thing in terms of helping us essentially cross the, the, the economic divides and really close the gap between have and have nots, microfinance, and that's a great thing. What we unfortunately can't ignore, and you've raised it extraordinarily well, is the asymmetry because you've lowered the barrier to entry for the bad actors and although it's wonderful that you can scale a business with tremendous rapidity by going on the cloud and standing it up using other people's resources, that's wonderful. Similarly, the bad actors, as you correctly point out, even one, it doesn't have to be a state actor anymore, can slave tens of thousands of machines simply by sending people notes that say, here's $5 for free, and you know, no matter how much you tell people, don't click the thing, they click <laughs> it, and now they've got a bot in their machine. So they create 10,000 warriors in a matter of minutes, mm. minutes. And we don't have the apparatus yet. This is one of the great challenges because I chair the Meta Council on Emerging Technologies. We do not have the apparatus yet that can respond at the rate and pace that cyber is evolving. It's really, it used to be you needed, what, five attackers to every defender, I believe was the military standard? Yeah. Three, well, sorry. Yeah. At, at this point, you're gonna need 10 defenders to every one attacker. Right a hundred defenders, and that changes the economic picture for the globe. So it's imperative, uh, it, it's incumbent on all of us to ferret this out. You cannot have state actors supporting this. It's bad enough individuals, but when you have a state actor and a 10 to 1 or 100 to 1 multiplier, it would be catastrophic to the economy on the long run. So it's, it is a challenge, and Thank I think you've you raised it well. And oh, let me use this opportunity also, Bernard, one of the people we work with on, on thinking through the say the, the cyber uh, security threats and also the whole new, you know, so let's say the dark side of the fourth industrial revolution, mm -hmm. which is not only cyber, but the cyber plus a number of other technological advances, which has the very unwelcome effect of democratizing the access to massive destruction and changing, as you said, the order of uh, attack and defense, which of course weakens the role of the state in the world compared to other actors. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, a m and there's a many, examples of that and there will be other panels where we will discuss this in deeper detail but as a teaser if you're not worried enough there's more to come uh, 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 on this front <laughs> um, I, I want to move 
over to the issue of violent extremism in a second, but um, could you, just as a military reflection on these issues, what does it mean to, let's say, to military thinking, military theories, military preparedness? Uh, well, on the one hand, uh, cyber is a continuation of what's been traditional in the military sphere, which is um, the interplay of offense and defense. Mm. So knights in armor be are overcome by archers shooting long arrows at Cressy. Um, the uh, mass male formations are overcome by tanks in the Second World War. Um, the nuclear weapon arrives on the scene, and somehow we've managed thus far not to use one uh, other than at the very end of the Second World War. Um, but offense and defense continue to go back and forth. As Bernie points out correctly, at the moment, offense is a lot easier. So you really have two choices from a military perspective. You amp up the defense, and you need to do that. You need to work that piece of it. And there's a, a whole realm of things within that, both technological protocols and so forth. And then you also have to consider, Espen, how do we inculcate a regime of deterrence on the offensive side, state to state? Because these, w these weapons, and they are weapons, are moving toward the level of mass destruction. They're not, they're not there yet. But over time, we're going to need a regime in place similar to what has prevented the use of nuclear weapons to use the prevention regime in the case of cyber. So we've seen it before. We're going to need to apply some of that as we go forward. Uh, but I think it will consume us in a security way uh, in the decades to come. Where would you see that regime emerging? Where would you look to see if it's there or it's I think it'll. I think it'll start um, between um, the major cyber powers who not purely coincidentally happen to be nuclear powers. So uh, dialogue, I think principally initially between the United States and China is called for in this regard. Uh, Russia is a significant cyber actor. Some of the NATO countries have significant capability in this regard. Um, but I think it'll have to emerge bilaterally initially. But it is possible to me that there could be some kind of an international discussion about it. Um, and this is a bit of a metaphorical stretch, but not completely differently than what we saw in the creation of the Law of the Sea, the United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Sea. Long term, we probably need something like that in the cyber world. But initially, we're going to have to address the use of weapons of cyber, I think, in bilateral, trilateral kinds of ways between significant actors. But if I may say, that's, in a sense, the classical answer. Yeah. You look for states to regulate again. Yeah. I, I wonder if we actually need more than, we need that, but more. That this is also a dialogue for Google and Amazon and Alibaba and, no uh, question. and, and IBM and so on. This is both, much of the infrastructure is private. Yeah. And, and much of it is global in the sense that while the company may have a headquarters, some of it in the US, it's not American companies in that sense. Absolutely and, correct. And, and, and so many of the victims of this activity are not necessarily a, another country, but it's a global infrastructure. And in, right. in the World Economic Forum uh, outlook on the world, we need a multi-stakeholder approach to yeah. this, which we actually would like to facilitate. Yeah, mm. and we need to probably begin by defining mm. within our state system mm. Who's defending whom? Mm. Um, in other words, when a, a company, a private enterprise, is attacked in the cyber world, is that a state and national responsibility to defend it? Mm. Um, we have not really worked through that. I, I often say to people, if North Korea had sunk a Carnival cruise liner worth $300 million, the responses would have been fairly obvious but they did $300 million worth of kinetic damage to a commercial entity mm. in the United States. And the responses are not so obvious. So this is another factor. But you are absolutely correct to point out the private-public nexus in the cyber world mm. is crucial alongside the state discussion that we're having. Could we say, we're open to questions. If somebody has a question on this before we move a little. Somebody yeah. right behind you. Mm. You talk about the dialogue that's necessary. Microphone, because it's webcast. Um, Admiral Stavridis, you talk about the dialogue that's necessary between Russia and China and, and yeah. the U.S. on the cyber issue. How do you address the great divergence in how um, these powers think about cyber problems? In the West, we tend to be very focused on the kinetic impact. When you look at the Russian doctrine or the Chinese doctrine, they think about information operations. So the Russian president has often said that a blog post that's critical of the Russian government 
he considers to be a cyber attack, obviously something that's very core to the Western values. Um, well, first of all, even defining a cyber attack um, is something that doctrinally we have not concluded. It does run on a spectrum from uh, a blog post, if you will, at the very lightest end of it, to taking down a nation's electric grid. I think we can all agree uh, the latter is certainly an attack. Uh, we can, most of us agree, the former probably isn't. There's an awful lot in there in terms of data disruption, data manipulation, uh, creation of further kinetic effect, but less than electrical grid. So we've got to start by defining that uh, level of attack. As to how we do that, again, uh, there's no mystery here. It's going to be, this is where we roll up our sleeves and use good old-fashioned diplomacy and dialogue. Um, we, we cannot afford to stumble uh, into a cyber cold war, uh, but I fear that's where we're headed. A couple of, um, Susan Levin, yeah. Thank you so much. I especially appreciate the comments before on inclusion and on equality. Mm -hmm. And my question to you really stems from what do you see as successful efforts globally to try to promote that, especially given that social media is now helping people understand their levels of inequality or what's happening around the world and what others have versus they may feel like they are the have-nots or inclusion. And so what is happening now from a security standpoint to increase inclusion, to improve jobs, to help people choose a path of productivity instead of de destructivity so that those individuals, for example, who may be computer science interested are focusing on creating apps instead of creating hacks? That's a, that's a great question. Hold your answer a second. Is, the next question is, is this through the cyber thing or is it through the... So we'll stick to cyber and well, because I wanted to go to those issues as we come to the end. Yes, it's you. Uh, I have a prediction to share and I'd like to your opinion whether or not you believe it's uh, more or less accurate. I think the cyber attacks will continue for the next 50 years uh, at very uh, intense level. And <coughs> this number is the uh, number of years the current users of Microsoft Windows operating system will continue using this system, get, uh, uh, get retired, and become very old. And after that period, I think the uh, number of cyber attacks will subside because it will be easier, uh, will be more, much more difficult to conduct them when the other operating systems like open source Linux is used. End of question. You have the answer to the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, all right. Um, any comment to that particular? I, I think it, ma it makes the point very well that technology will change, it will adapt, adapt. and there are going to be uh, n new ways of thinking about this in 50 years. The one I would add to this is it is going to be the merger of what today we think of as information technology and biology. And, and this, I think, is really uncharted territory as we think about uh, how those two connect. Ray Kurzweil, the singularity is near, the fourth industrial revolution, et cetera. Big changes ahead, and, and he's absolutely right. We should not over-focus on the modalities of the moment, especially in this sphere. On the connection to bio, we're looking into that. And a, um, an interesting observation is when, when you're in order to get nuclear weapons, you need fissile material. There are certain ways to control that. One of the key ingredients is in bio weapons, which you can, is that you need uh, technology at the level of a microbrewery, and you need yeast, yeah. which is slightly more complicated to control. So just, uh, again, a <laughs> teaser on these issues. Yeah. But, but let me, um, to Susan's question, and let's, let's try to, to move back to, to where I think Jean-Marie started, the connection between this uh, highly connected, so this hyper-connected world, uh, information flowing in all directions, everybody in principle, in principle, everybody can talk to everybody else, but rather, it seems that rather than that leading to more convergence, it leads to more divergence, because you can pick your particular topic, and, and uh, you know, back in the old days in the village, there weren't enough mad people around to form a club. <laughs> But you know, if there are seven billion people to take from, uh, there's probably a few that will share your particular interest. And this, of right. course, creates it's a global phenomenon, but it plays into very local and localized, and let's say very parochial conflicts, which then gets this global phenomenon. Which I think so. The inclusiveness, as you mentioned, which I think is in inclusiveness not only in economic terms, I think, but also by you know access to a, a sense of being part of something, is seems to be one of the 
takeaways of this session so far? Any reflections on the connections between all this? Well, I think the, we live in a world with a juxtaposition, so to speak, of bubbles, mm. uh, small and big. You can uh, live in a world where you only meet people who think like you, you yourself uh, think, and that's sort of a self-reinforcing uh, loop that is quite a dangerous one. Uh, because freedom, invention, has to be born out of serendipity, what's happening in Davos, actually. <laughs> uh, but uh, with the, with the, and the internet, if you use it well, can bring that serendipity, but it can also just make you comfortable with the people you're already comfortable with. And that's what we see with the virtual communities of, uh, of, of terrorism. And, and I think there's one, uh, one aspect I would want, because we didn't discuss it, that I would want to stress, is that we, we talk of terrorism as a kind of the strategic threat. And when we do that, we unify movements that are quite different. Mm. Uh, and that is, that is very unwise. Because when you look at the reasons why terrorists join a terrorist movement, they are each, uh, each country, each group has its own uh, specific dynamics. And we, when we unify them, we are doing them a service. And I think there, the way terrorism sometimes is elevated as the strategic threat, including the strategic military threat, is not wise. Indeed, there is a need for a military dimension to the response. You don't want terrorism, terrorists to have a kind of aura of, in, of invincibility. But at the same time, I think the political dimension of fighting terrorism is way uh, underdeveloped. Uh, and so long as we do not look at the politics, at the conditions under which terrorist groups develop, we will have the hammer. We know how to use a hammer. We'll bang on the terrorists with bombs. Uh, we will degrade them, which is a good thing, but we will not solve uh, the issue. And that's very much linked to this issue of connectivity. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that's exactly right. And the, you know, the classic way to think of this, unfortunately, is an on and off switch. In other words, hard power or soft power. <laughs> Wrong image. It, it is, as you imply correctly, it's a rheostat. You have to dial it in. And there are times when you need the hard power particularly up front, but the long game are all the things Madam Minister has talked about, the inclusion, the economic growth, the education. I want to say that word again, education. Um, enormous part of it, that's the long game. And we need to stop thinking about it and having arguments about is it a hard power or is it a soft power. You absolutely are going to need both. You have to be able to dial that rheostat in. I'd like to move from there to you again because in Compared to 20 years ago, and I'm talking about Africa, no, not Rwanda, mm -hmm. the, the, um, the, the, the stated will of Africa to be the primary responder to challenges in Africa has been a significant, and I, in my view, very positive development. So I'm sure in the African political circles, African Union and so on, this conversation must be a frequent conversation. How do we, what's the right response? You know, in the Horn of Africa, in, in Mali, in Car, uh, wherever these issues pop up, how do you find the right combination of hard power and soft power in reality, and what's the, what's the discussion you are a part of in the African continent on that issue? Indeed, I think, um, well, I know in, um, on the African continent, um, there are many conversations going in, you know, crisscrossing and, and all trying to figure out uh, how to use power uh, properly, soft power, hard power, um, but my, let me just inject my, my own uh, personal uh, thinking. When, and it's, it's, it's part of uh, what Jean-Marie was saying about giving importance and linking the bad guys. Uh, in fact, I personally think it's wrong to, um, to keep broadcasting the beheadings. And I, I, just, I just find it, um, a way of uh, giving the bad guys what they want, and I, I just disagree with it. But in the discussions uh, on the continent, one of the things we've been looking at is, is first and foremost to understand that it is in our power to do a number of things, not to do everything, but we're capable of um, dealing with uh, some of the conflicts, uh, some of the violence, and from there decide how to do it. Um, 
in my part of Africa, which is East Africa, uh, we decided within the bigger African Union um, uh, goal of creating these um, uh, standby forces uh, to quickly uh, get commitments uh, from each one of the, of the 11 or 12 countries in, in Eastern Africa. So that conversation itself revealed that there was conviction on the continent that we're not doing some of the things we could be doing to, to secure our space, to secure our economic uh, uh, gains. And it's, it's more a matter of getting organized and making it a point to, to sit down and, and figure out what to do. So with uh, the, East, uh, the Eastern Africa region, for example, um, we managed to put together a standby force, the Eastern Africa standby force, uh, with strong commitment from small island countries like uh, Seychelles, for example, countries that have no armies, um, so to speak, but with their own commitment, whether it's money, whether it's um, uh, expertise uh, <laughs> of uh, different uh, types, bring everybody's strengths together. <laughs> that in itself has been a, a deterrent. Uh, unfortunately, I wish uh, the, the continental and global politics uh, had allowed us to use the standby force in Burundi in the beginning. Uh, I think it would have been a very important deterrent, but you know, politics being politics um, from New York to Addis Ababa um, to uh, Arusha, which is in Tanzania, in East African community, there were different positions uh, about that. But the most important takeaway uh, for, for me is that once we start having serious discussions about our assets, our strengths, and bringing them together, really pausing and thinking that there is a problem, we must solve it, it is part of our responsibility, then how do we solve it? We can always borrow from other um, uh, entities away from the continent, we can um, um, talk about uh, finances, we can talk about sustenance, but the most important thing is, is to have that conversation. What do we in Africa do to start stopping some of the uh, honestly uh, very unnecessary conflicts which are keeping us behind. You know, we, we have uh, had time to um, fight for independence um, uh, and now the, the, the priority should be fighting for a good life for our people, uh, getting rid of poverty, advancing in many different ways, providing uh, the education uh, to our children and, and, and securing the future. So, so for me, um, if the will is there, then, then let's get organized. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like the will is there, but in, in, in at least in, in a number of African countries, but you are, I guess you're still struggling with uh, Admiral Saridi's question, how do, you, how do you calibrate, you know, the use of the hard tools that you clearly have, like the yes. Amisom in Somalia, with the political and economic and, let's say, social tracks? Yes, mm. yes, absolutely. And, and I'll slightly go back to my, my uh, <coughs> introductory uh, comments. We have, uh, we have Somalia, uh, because something went wrong in Somalia and nobody really paid serious attention and stopped and, and thought, you know, this is a country with, uh, with, with a great history, with an, an interesting uh, future, Let, let's solve this problem. So I, I think there is a level of seriousness that then allows us to combine the different tools. Uh, who can contribute what uh, to, to this discussion and eventually whether it's uh, you know military force, uh, whether it's different types of deterrence, uh, whether it's it's actually even if you look <coughs> at uh, uh, the the conflict in South Sudan, for example, we all got very excited about this new country that was becoming independent, and you know we in the international uh, community and and in the international politics, we get very excited about agreements and signing some agreement and 
uh, you know, as if that's the, we all know it's not the end of it, uh, but South Sudan did not, South Sudan needed to be accompanied uh, as a new state. South Sudan today uh, has been suffering from not moving to the, the, the whole notion of a country, a nation. The, the mentality very much with different actors is, is it remains very fragmented and very, you know, the, even, even the formation of the army has a lot uh, of, of, you know, bringing together different militias. So, so what was needed in South Sudan, for example, in terms of calibrating uh, these different um, um, tools that we have, was to actually stay the course, be there with South Sudan. Countries started throwing money at South Sudan. South Sudan did not need money including at all. Uh, yes, including your, your, your country. Just to be there, give them expertise, help them manage their oil, advise them not to cut <laughs> off uh, uh, Khartoum when they have no other way to sell their uh, oil to, to the rest of the world. Um, help them build an administration, basic things. Uh, so all, all these are different tools that unfortunately we're all running and, and moving to the next uh, area of interest or, or crisis. And, and I, I really think looking at uh, not just Africa, but that's the, the area I'm, I'm most familiar with. But for other, other yeah. co conflicts and, and, yeah. and places uh, of interest as well, you can look at it also from uh, the perspective of terrorism. Mm. Other than talking about it so much and expressing concern, are we doing enough in really reflecting and pulling together the different assets uh, that mm, are yeah. needed? And I, coming, thank you very much, Louis. Mm. Excellent. And I, by the way, I, I'd like to say I very much agree with your analysis of what we, we all did wrong. That includes <coughs> my, myself, my time in power with things South Sudan. Things are looking up with South Sudan, but we wasted well, we so much through time, a rather tough and, uh, time and so yes, many yeah. lives. But isn't actually the aggregate message here, is, uh, which I think connects to the whole discussion, and I, I, the two of you to quickly comment on that. Despite the globalization and connectedness, people still live in states. Mm -hmm. And if this, you get the state wrong, as South Sudan and so many other places, yeah. you can't really it doesn't help you that you be, you're online and you're connected to the rest of the world. It yeah. doesn't make it any better. Exactly. We still have to understand that the international system requires order and structure and politics yeah. at a state governmental level. I agree with that. Mm. I, I think the, the, the key, again, is that we, we have this tendency to think we can deliver security from the barrel of a gun. And we will never do that. We cannot deliver security from the barrel of a gun. We're going to need some guns along the way. But over time, it's dialing that rheostat in the direction of the long game that's going to solve these challenges. And we have examples of this, as I mentioned. Colombia, for example, has gradually moved that dial away from the hard power piece toward the inclusive piece, the build the economy. And they're going to deliver a peace agreement. Um, we talked about the Balkans. We've seen Rwanda. The place that you and I would have been discussing five years ago, of course, is Afghanistan, which is very much still at play in this world. And we're trying to find the right place to set that dial in Afghanistan. But I think there, the number that I'll give you to kind of close, it's back to education. <coughs> Under the Taliban, 500,000 boys all went to school. Today, over 9 million children boys and girls are going to school in Afghanistan. That's the long game. That's how, if we succeed in Afghanistan, and it's still an if, um, it'll be because of that kind of long-term investment. Some hard power along the way, certainly, but it's, it's playing that long game that I think will deliver security best, not the barrel of a gun. Thank you, Jim. And since you mentioned Afghanistan, for the security outlook session on Friday, Ashraf Ghani, the president I of saw that will be there. So yep. if you wonder what happened over these last five years, come there. Exactly. Shamari, last word to you. Well, 20 years ago, I wrote a book actually on the end of the nation state. <laughs> <laughs> and because uh, I think it was already in some way in a crisis. And I think the challenge today, frankly, is that on the one hand, if you want to mobilize communities, you need to be able to identify with the state. But at the same time, it is more and more 
there's a sad reality that there are many issues that a state alone cannot address. I look at the Sahel, I look at a country like Niger, where the median age is something like 15, 15, year, 15 and a half uh, years. There is no way Niger on its own will be able to address all the issues it is confronted with. It needs broader supporting structures. But, and that combination of being able to mobilize the a sort of national identity, a national project for a country like Niger, and at the same time admitting that there has to be a broader framework. That's a challenge you see in many parts of the world. And how you connect those different layers, so to speak, from the, from the city level. Cities are the future of the world in many ways. From yeah. now more than half of the population lives in cities, to states, to regions, to the global community. That is something that not, we are not good at. I mean, the minister was, was discussing when the, the, the welcome engagement of uh, Africans <coughs> in African issues. And we see, for instance, that the United Nations and the African Union haven't got it really right yet in how to address those issues. So I think the, the challenge for security tomorrow is how we stop being a juxtaposition of bubbles but we connect these different layers in a constructive way. That's an excellent way to, start, uh, to end this session, which is just the beginning of a long series of conversations on security. Thank you very much to all the participants. Let me quickly mention that before you applaud the speakers, we have a, 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 an excellent international security team. Just highlight Anja Kaspersen, Isabel de Sola, Philip Shetter Jones, who are all here with us. And uh, talk to me or them if you want more information on the work we're doing in this area. Some of you are already connected, but there's more to come. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here. And uh, see you in the next session. Thank you.